The talk is called Unraveling Emotional Mysteries, and um, it starts with an app, my favorite app. I take it out every morning and sort of use it to define my identity as an emotion detective. And so this is sort of how I thought about right, this talk today, and it starts with the question, what does every good emotion detective need? And we start by needing some good clues. And, and for me, uh, as Dacker said, the clues really start with a phenomenon. Um, this is the thing, uh, Paul, you may recognize this guy. We ran uh, him in your lab in San Francisco. Um, this is the thing that, where I look for clues. Uh, this is a fellow who's going to see a, an industrial accident. There's the bloody hand and you're gonna see him engage in this remarkable behavioral chore choreography that unfolds over about 20 seconds. And um, this is the place that I have looked for clues. And um, we're looking at kind of what's going on above the surface, but if we look beneath the hood, we see that uh, there's also quite a lot of interesting activity in this clue fest. Um, this, is, this black line is where the bloody hand appeared, and this red line is the subject's heart rate, and the green line is the skin conductance. And at that moment when, when this event uh, occurred in this, uh, that he took in, almost immediately these two systems started to activate, and I'm following heart rate here, and they go through these kinds of waves of activation and deactivation that really mirror what you saw on his face and his body as this unfolded over time. The blue dots and the little pictures are the moments where the expression became most powerful and apexed. And you can see that the first expression occurred right at the moment when the physiology started to activate and then the second expression occurred right at the peak of heart rate, and then it was almost as if it were a, a pressure release valve. As he expressed, he cooled down a little bit, it built up to the next peak, and he expressed again. And so underneath the hood of emotion, there's all of these wonderful clues about how the nervous system is organizing these systems that most of the time are operating in a very uncoordinated way in the service of things other than emotion. An emotion detective also needs a good magnifying class if, he, if she's or he is going to look for clues. And um, I'm kind of a simple scientist. I, I have a few tools that I use over and over again. Um, I think the first thing was to try to find a way to study actual emotional functioning. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about our ideas about our emotional lives and, and those of others. But I think for me, the, the, the powerful place to look was in the momentary unfolding of the emotional response. And, and I wanted to do it by and large using as naturalistic elicitors as possible so I could bring into the laboratory what emotions might look like in the real world. Now, we've already sort of taken a look on that first slide at all the things that are going on in an emotional event. And each one unfolds over time. So one of the important aspects of the magnifying glass is that it has to be able to focus on behavior, which is very complicated, physiology, which is arguably even more complicated, and also emotional experience, each of which has to be measured in, in challenging ways, in ways that don't interrupt the flow of emotion, in ways that can be quantified quite precisely, and ways that can be compared and coordinated. So it's a very important part of the magnifying glass. Um, as Dacker said, one of the fortunate things that happened early on was um, John Gottman and I were both sort of outcasts in the middle of the Midwest and lost souls and we found each other. And we, we thought, well, maybe we should do something together because we're just so bored. And, uh, and so we kind of cooked up this idea for how to study couples and um, you know, put them in, in, a, in a room, have them sit across from each other, wire them up for physiology, have some cameras that recorded their behavior, take a videotape, 
show them the videotape, get them to tell us how they were feeling. And we sort of perfected this. We, we started working on this, I believe, around 1978. And our first publications were in the early 80s. But this is the kind of the gold standard for me. I still, if I really want to know whether a finding makes sense, whether it's with normals, young people, old people, people from other cultures, people with uh, mental illness or neurological disease, I always want to see them in this social context to see whether the ideas really hold. So this has been a very useful uh, part of the magnifying glass. The other things um, uh, that, that I think was important was to think about, and you're going to see this in this talk a lot, that. Emotion's not one thing, it's a lot of things, and I've been interested in three big processes. Uh, the first of these is reactivity, and that is how the uh, nervous system generates an emotional response to something of significance in the environment. And we measure things like the magnitude and the duration and the latency of that reaction. Uh, as Dacker said, starting uh, with uh, the gift of James Gross in the lab, we got interested in re regulation. Uh, humans are not content to just have emotions. We, we're, we're adjusters. We, almost, we probably never have an emotion that we just let alone. We almost always do something to it. We boost it up, or we cut it down, or we cover it up, or we sort of do some other ledger domain. Um, and when you study emotion regulation, you have the challenge of what people can do when you tell them, okay, don't let your emotion show. That's what we did first. And then you also have what they do in their, in their everyday practice, which can be quite different. Like some of the greatest regulators on the planet are just hopeless in their interpersonal lives. You, know, they, they, you can tell them what to do, but on their own, they just have no idea. And then last, there's the, the recognition of emotion. How we come to understand what we're feeling, what others are feeling, and what we do with that information. And of course, Dacher Keltner has been a pioneer in this work, looking at empathy and compassion, pro-social behavior, and then the dark side of emotion. Uh, as a recent book was titled, How Emotions Can Be Used uh, to Manipulate Others and to Exploit Them. So this, this is where we are so far with our spec sheet for the magnifying glass to be a good emotion detector. And then there's some other things. Um, in our work, we've almost never studied undergraduates. Uh, in fact, I worry that maybe everything we found doesn't generalize to college freshmen. <laughs> I can't sleep at night. You know, I may, we may just have misrepresented everything. Um, so we almost always use community samples, and as much as possible, we, we try to use them in ways where they're recruited to be representative of the community. Now, that community is Berkeley, so it's probably not representative of anything else. And then longitudinal designs have been an important part of this work because not only do emotions change over 30 seconds of unfolding, but they change over 30 and 40 years of life, and they change in interesting and powerful ways. And then when you relate it to outcomes, we try to measure things that are meaningful and are, and are re relevant to emotion, like health and wellness and well-being. All right. So the last thing that an emotion detective needs is some really good mysteries. And this is not a complete list of the mysteries that we've looked at in my lab, uh, but it's sort of uh, a sampling, and it's the, <laughs> it's the ones I mentioned in the abstract to this talk. And I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'm going to talk about a few of them today. Um, and, and they all are, what I love about these mysteries is that you can work on them forever. I mean, we, I feel like we've made a little bit of progress on them, but each one of them still has these, un, these interesting unanswered questions that will be occupying our, our lab and your labs, hopefully, for decades to come. All right. So let's get started. But before we get to any of that, I know you're all here for one particular mystery. We all really, really want to know the answer, and that is... This is great getting this award, because I, I, and I'm so glad Paul's here, because this is the work we did together. So this is what most people like us <laughs> you know, think an emotion looks like and sort of how it works. And you know, it's a simple idea. There's some sort of an, an antecedent condition. It gets appraised. Now, when I use appraisal, I'm not 
thinking that, that that has to be something really complicated and elaborate. That can be something very primitive in the nervous system that's, you know, some, some match to template that doesn't, that doesn't require any consciousness. And then it activates this sort of affect program, as Sylvan Tompkins called it. It's kind of a big computer program which has a subroutine for the face and a subroutine for vocalization and one for motor activity and one for the autonomic nervous system. And there's some other things as well. So that's the basic idea. And uh, in that example that we started the talk with, uh, this fellow here, uh, it was a, the antecedent was a blood injury and he, the emotion was discussed. And the facial expression, I hope I got this right, is, uh, was AU9 and 19 and 25. So it was uh, nose wrinkled and the lips parted and the tongue moved forward. And you couldn't hear it, but there was a vocalization where, where he kind of went, eh, maybe he did hear it. And you can see the motor pattern is clear. I mean, he's really getting as far away from this video screen as possible. And I showed you the autonomic activity, which was sudden, powerful, and organized. But James, looking at this, um, said, them arrows are going in the wrong way. The emotion both begins and ends with what we call its effects or manifestations. Any voluntary arousal of the so-called manifestations ought to give us the emotion itself. And, um, so this is the Jamesian idea that the emotions go backwards. And this appraisal is probably something very primitive in the brain that activates the emotion. And um, this, uh, because I was visiting Paul Ekman's lab and, and learning about the face, and because they had, he and Wally Friesen had been thinking about this, we decided to ask to take this seriously and really see whether or not it worked. And we, not surprisingly, picked the face. But I kind of think if we had picked any of these other things, we probably would have gotten the same thing. I mean, other people have, have pursued it in that way. And so we needed a way to produce facial expression as the starting point. And it really wouldn't be right to tell people, look disgusted, because you kind of give it away that way. Uh, so how do we get to this point without ever saying anything about disgust. And this was uh, the brilliant idea that Paul had that we would kind of trick people into getting the, this on their face. Okay, well you wrinkle your nose, that's it. Let your lips part, raise your upper lip a little more. Uh, now leave your eyebrows alone, just wrinkle your nose. Your upper lip, that's it. Now let your tongue move forward in your mouth, it doesn't have to stick out, but just forward. And keep that nose wrinkled. Now hold that. Okay, rest your face. So, in a way, we were able to end up at this end point without ever saying anything about emotion. And what happened when we did that was very interesting. So the first thing is, if the face ended up looking like this, over 60% of the time, people reported feeling disgust. That pretty, you know, that's a, that's a pretty, given what the chance would be, there were six emotions. And if the face wasn't very good, if they weren't very good at getting there, they still had a significant likelihood of reporting disgust but it was much, much lower. And then when we looked at the autonomic nervous system, we found evidence that not all these, that each of these expressions or configurations was producing a somewhat different pattern of autonomic activity. So disgust in heart rate didn't have the kind of the powerful, probably sympathetically driven activation that the other negative emotions had. And between anger and fear, there were differences in finger temperature. So, I think this was very intriguing evidence that suggested that going in this other direction, James was probably right. You could produce something that kind of looked like an emotion. It had it on the face, people said they were feeling it, and their body was responding in a reasonable way. So for each of these questions, as I said, there's much more work to do. 
Uh, over the next decade, we, we looked at a number of issues of generalizability about this phenomena, including looking in other cultures and other ages. Uh, we evaluated a number of alternative hypotheses. And at the end, I think we both felt that, uh, that this sort of held up, that whatever it was, it was a, it was a reliable phenomenon. Now, it leaves a number of questions that, of course, we don't know. Are these real emotions? I mean, they have all the parts, but they're not exactly real emotions, are they? There's something array. Does this autonomic patterning generalize to more conventional ways of eliciting emotion? And I think most interesting, how does this all work? Now, it, when we were doing this in, in, in the early 1980s, we didn't know much about the brain. And I remember in one of our papers, we speculated that there might be a central pattern generator that sort of recognized that configuration on the, on the face. That is increasingly becoming accepted, not by our work, but by, by work from modern neuroscience, that that is what the brain, the brain can do, that it recognizes these patterns of peripheral activation, and that it is a way of activating a, a other aspects aspects of emotional response. So I think we were on the right track there. Um, what else is James right about? Well, this was another big Jamesian idea. In our sort of model, where's the feeling? You know, where's the beef? And he said, well, the feeling is our feeling of the changes that occur in the emotion. And so the Jamesian idea was that if you sort of took all of this peripheral stuff and you accumulated it and then you sort of integrated it, it would be the subjective experience or feeling. So it is, in a way, feeling comes from the activity of the machine. And, um, and I think this is a powerful idea that more and more people have come to accept. Certainly, uh, Dacker has written about it. We've written about it. Um, one of the interesting implications about it, oh, and I think it's a basic idea in the work of Bud Craig in, in what happens in the brain and the anterior insula. But one of the interesting implications of this is how do we measure this subjective experience or feeling? Well, we can't put electrodes on it. So we measure it by asking people to label their emotion or to rate their emotion. But those kinds of measures are really quite different. They're constructed, usually post hoc. In the early days, people would wait a half an hour before they asked people what they felt. We don't do that anymore. They're influenced by the context. We know that from work going back to Schachter and Singer. And they really are put together in a very different way in the brain. So you see in disease that people who can't do that computation, still have facial expression and physiological reaction. So, you know, this is, a, this is, I think, one of the real challenges for affective science, is that this stuff is different than this stuff in such profound ways. And when we try to aggregate findings from these different methods, it's a challenge, and we have to be mindful that it could be that there are times when these agree, and we know that they are, but there also are going to be times when they don't. So on to the other mysteries, and I'll, uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is how are emotions influenced by normal aging? Well, let's start with something easier. How are cognitive and physical functioning influenced by normal aging? Laura Carstensen has the best version of this. I stole it from her. This is a, a, a plot of cognitive and physical functioning and age. It just, you know, you can, you can just sort of apply it to everything. And so, okay, so it's just a bunch of sarcastic people who used to be young, and now, now it's not so funny. Uh, <laughs> but here's a, a wonderful study from uh, Parkin in, in 2002, where, where she uh, plots a number of, of cognitive test performances. And, you know, that's it. The only thing that doesn't change are the two white lines, and those are both vocabulary. Um, so uh, does emotional functioning follow the same course? That was the question that we were interested in. There's no question about this, but interestingly in our work looking at, now this is normal aging, these are people who are well, emotion looks very different. It's really quite preserved into late life. And in some areas, and this is of course really encouraging the older you get, emotional functioning actually improves with age. And I'm gonna uh, show you an example. Strangely enough, one of the areas that emotional functioning improves in is in this realm of emotional recognition in the hardest task that we do. You know, this is not just looking at a smiling face and saying, happy. This is looking at these couples interacting in the middle of all this noise 
figuring out what somebody's feeling and how it changes moment to moment. So here's a typical uh, study. Uh, we have people uh, who are different ages and they're watching interactions of couples and they continuously rate how one of the spouses was feeling. And I know it's 9.30 in the morning and we're all kind of hung over from the joys of last night, but we're gonna do this now and see how you do. So this is a real couple. You're gonna have to focus on the husband. Um, I know that he rated his feelings during this period using a rating dial on a one to nine scale where five is neutral, nine is very positive, and one is very negative. Now I'm just gonna start this, play you about 10 seconds, and then I'm gonna ask you, where would you put the dial, okay? How's, how is he feeling? So you say, go ahead, you start. You say, you would have been better. You would have better off if I'd backed you for not having children. If you had backed you for not. Okay, let's stop it there, because you would have had to make a rating. So how is he feeling? Very positive, very, very kind of neutral, very, very negative. Okay. Don't just sit there. Make, make a guess. So this is how he was feeling. He was feeling about a little bit above six. He was actually feeling pretty well. Now let's go a little further. Pretty good, excuse me. So you say, go ahead, you start. You say you would have been better, you would have been better off if I had backed you for not having children? If you had backed you for not having children? If you had backed me. Oh, Tom, that's so. If that had happened, think of no. how about a marriage we would have had. I don't know. I tell you, yes. Oh, you're just Nelly? saying that. No, I don't think so. It's such no. an insult to me, no. Tom. Hold on a minute, this is To that. reduce me to such no. a level. I wanted so much to share a life with you instead of sharing. Okay, how was he feeling? How many of you think he's feeling better? <laughs> okay, well, he didn't like that at all. <laughs> and, and this is the way emotions work in these interactions. They go up and down and up and down, and we get people to do these ratings, and we compare them to people's own ratings as the criterion. And the, the thing that's interesting is in a number of studies, people actually get better and better at this as they get older. Even though it's a complicated visual motor task and things are going really fast, there's something about either the older brain or, or the um, older living a long life that helps us get better at this. So, we have another, a number of other areas where older people are actually more emotionally powerful. They are much more reactive to the stress of others. They're better able to downregulate emotions, as Lonnie Shioda's work, by uh, using positive reappraisal. And um, it raises the interesting question of how in the world, you know, in a brain that's getting so much worse at cognition and a body that's getting so much worse that everything might this happen? And this is where my musical training came, comes in uh, handy. I think that one of the things that aging does is it retunes our brain. And this is a graphic equalizer where we're adjusting different frequencies, but you can really think about those as different neural circuits. And probably what we think about is that aging just causes things to be tuned down. Well, that's probably true, but even if you tune something down, something else that's next to it might become an alternative route. So if you turn down the things in the brain that process really high frequency information, you might actually do better in pulling out the gist of the emotion in a social interaction. Young people are looking at the fashion, they're looking at the little things. Older people might be looking at the big slower things and doing much better. But the other thing that's important to know about aging is that um, this is really what the brain looks like. There are excitatory circuits and inhibitory circuits. And so some of the things that, the, that aging does to the brain is it reduces inhibitory circuits, and so other things are relatively released. And so you, uh, Virginia Sturm and I have been working on this with disease, but you can have some interesting increases in, in generation of emotion that occur because you have disease or age that, dim that diminishes the power of these inhibitory circuits. So the aging brain, in, as far as emotion research is concerned, is really full of interesting possibilities that we're just scratching the surface of. Okay, um, what are the sources of emotional differences among individuals? We've worked a lot on this, and we've looked at gender. Um, Jeannie Sai is here. She uh, led our effort into studying the effect of culture. 
I've been talking about aging. I'm going to talk about brain injury in a second. But most recently, we've been interested in some of the genetic influences on individual differences in emotional functioning. And when I say emotional differences, we're talking about who has the big emotions? Who has the, the long emotions? You know, who has the happier emotions, the more p positive ones? And looking at differences in how tightly the different parts of emotion are, hang together. So this is a, a series of studies that we've been working on uh, recently with genes, and uh, we've been studying the, poly, the, the 5-HT-LPR polymorphism of the serotonin transporter gene. If you know anything about uh, gene, genetics work, uh, Claudia Haas is here. She's the person who's been our major person in this work. Um, you know that this is a, a cesspool of danger and controversy, but we decided to go into it, what idiots. Um, so there are quickly, there are two variants based on a 44 pair deletion or insertion in the promoter region. The, the big news is in the short version. If you have the short allele, the thing that clears the serotonin out of the synapse is not as efficient. So as a result, you can think about these people as having serotonin sitting in the synapses for a longer time every time they activate. And uh, the early view was if you had this, you were going to have a bad life. You were going to get depressed, you were going to get anxious, especially if you lived in a bad environment. Turns out that's not exactly the way it works. Uh, it, it, it appears that having all this extra serotonin or this longer lasting serotonin increases your sensitivity to the environment. So if you're in a good environment, you actually have a, have a good life. There's lots of controversy over the replicability. We decided to go at this in a different way. We weren't going to look initially at things that, that took, the, that would go in the crock pot and take 20 years to develop, but we're going to look at these sort of clues that I've been showing you, differences in these very discrete emotional moments that occur in response to discrete laboratory stimuli. And our hypothesis is that these short allele people really had a, an emotion system that just ran a little hotter. And so uh, a typical study, we show uh, people um, pictures of other people in distress, and then we look at their emotional responses. And uh, the findings here, this SS, are people who have two copies of the short allele, one from their mother and one from their father. And if you have them both, you report more distress when you see these, these uh, very moving images. You also have greater autonomic activity. This was our, one of our first studies. We also looked at positive emotion. Uh, Ursula Bierman was the leader in this work and uh, with Claudia Hassa. And now we have people look at cartoons from the far side or New Yorker. And it, if you have the, the short alleles, you laugh more. Uh, we have people look at an emotionally ambivalent film. This is uh, Stranger Than Paradise, the most boring film ever made. And uh, people with a short allele smiled more. Um, we uh, used the task that uh, I think we got from DACA originally and Virginia Stern brought into our lab, where we have people sing an old rock and roll song. I think this was My Girl. And we record it, and then they didn't know they were going to ever see it again. We play it back to them. It sounds awful, and people get really embarrassed. Uh, and uh, people with the short alleles show more amusement, or sorry, report more amusement, they report more anger, and they show more emotional behavior. So this is about five different independent samples, almost 500 subjects we've studied now. And in every aspect of emotion, whether it's positive or negative, we find that these short alleles are having larger versions of this uh, emotion that you saw at the beginning. And we think that this probably has huge implications over, over, to help us understand some of these more distal outcomes. Now, if you follow the, the research on uh, molecular genetics, you know there are lots of controversies. Single genes account for tiny amounts of the variants. People are looking for models for looking, combining the effects of multiple genes. And of course, there's the big issue and the great challenge for, I think, for psychological science. How do we carefully measure environments so we can understand how they enhance and depress these kinds of effects? A lot of our work in recent uh, a, uh, years has been focusing on how emotions are influenced by disease. And you know, there's no question that when you study neurological patients, you are in the world of emotional deficits. And, and I think that's interesting 
But I think the most fascinating thing for, for me as a, in terms of basic emotion research hasn't been the deficits, but what I call the perforations. And that is the sort of the interesting places where the emotion system, sort of a piece of it gets broken off by disease. So it's not a wholesale deficit, but it's something that becomes disconnected and either increases and de or decreases independent of the rest of the, of the emotion. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of it from some of the diseases we have studied. Um, ALS is a horrible disease, probably uh, you've, you've probably seen it in your, in your life or you know something about it. Let me just get that back on. And um, it's fairly rare, uh, but uh, when, it, when, when it happens, uh, people in their 40s are on, it's a kind of a broad spectrum motor neuron degeneration, and it affects the motor neurons involved with, with voluntary movement doesn't affect the brain very much initially. And what's horrible about the disease is your body stops functioning, but you're, you remain aware and you, you're, you can think and remember and experience the world. So it's a very difficult disease. Um, one of the interesting things about it uh, for us is that about 50% of the people with this disease develop what's called pseudobulbar affect. And that is uncontrollable bouts of crying or laughing. And there, we've, we've measured these things, and they are about two to four times the intensity of regular, normal emotional responses, which they're totally capable of having, uh, in, in both behavior and autonomic response. So I'm going to show you a patient who we've worked with who has both versions. Some people cry, some laugh. He has both. These are, just, these are very short. Um, okay. Yesterday, my, my yeah, youngest son had... By the way, we're, we're doing this in the uh, context, he's the patient, this is his wife, they're having a conversation. I'm gonna ask you to focus on him, but watching how the wife deals with it is another great area of research. A field trip to um, a local theater house. So it just comes on almost out of the blue, and you, you know, uh, Paul and I have looked at the uh, facial behavior. It's very consistent with what the emotion looks, should look like. Um, when I'm trying to say something, for some reason, internally, I find it hilarious. <laughs> uh, and there's, <laughs> there's really, really no reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's very striking, and uh, as I said before, when we tested these, these people in the lab and we show them amusing and sad films, their responses are just normal. They're, they're not bigger, they're not different. So they, they have two modes in a way. They have the pseudobulbar affect mode and then they have a normal mode. So here's the interesting perforation. Reports about this phenomenon go back to the 1920s in the neurological literature. Uh, the neurologist Wilson was the first one to describe it. No one has ever reported, and we have never seen, a sign of any behavior that looks like anger. They don't rage. They don't show fear. They don't show disgust. They only show laughing and crying. And sometimes they show yawning. And so there's a perforation in the emotion system that packages these two emotions together in some way that's vulnerable to this disease. Or maybe it's not the emotion. Maybe it's just the behavior and the physiology, you know, that it, but it begins to show that, you know, when we talk about emotion, it's really important to be thinking about which emotions we're studying because they may not all share, you know, they're not interchangeable parts and they may all function and be subserved quite differently in the brain. So this is an interesting perforation. Uh, another perforation, this is Virginia Sturm's work, is in our frontotemporal dementia population. This is an early onset dementia. Usually we see people in the fifth, their 50s in our lab. It's very anterior. It doesn't affect the memory areas of the brain, but it affects the areas that are responsible for social and emotional functioning, and that's where the changes show. Now, um, 
Virginia has found a really in for interesting perforation in terms of what we call self-related uh, emotional processing. So in this karaoke task, which I mentioned, I'm going to show you what it looks like. Here's what a normal person looks like when they Sunshine. hear themselves singing. <laughs> so they take it in. It, you know, it, it, it takes a little while. They process it. And then they have this emotional reaction to this to the situation. It's cold outside. <laughs> I've got the month of May. And it's a really an important part of our emotional lives because I think every time we have an emotion, we're very in, inclined to have a reaction to having had that emotion. And that's what it, this is a great paradigm for sort of looking at it. Well, here's a person with FTD. Now, this is a person who has no problem with the singing, the memory, describing what happened. I mean, they are just in the moment, and just, she's even a pretty good singer. And uh, they do this task. They see it. They recognize it. But that loop where you kind of are aware of yourself that's is dead. It just doesn't happen. And we see examples of that in this disease all the time, where the thing that requires sort of monitoring self is broken. And in fact, behaviorally, they do all sorts of things that suggest that they're not very aware of self. Now, this, um, you can see this uh, in, in, if you study it, in, this is a fairly large group of patients of controls. This is the relative amount of this kind of uh, self-aware behavior in the two groups. And you see the controls have way more. This is the most interesting thing to me. This is the skin conductance response. And when you see yourself, you know, the normals in orange, they have this pretty striking response. But in the, in the FTD patients, it's just not activating. It's just even seeing yourself doing this thing, it doesn't get into the system. So it's a really powerful perforation that I think this disease breaks. And when you see these kinds of waves of emotion and regulation and whatnot that, are, that really constitute our emotional lives, the connections that bridge from one event to another are apparently vulnerable to the disease. These people can have the little emotions under certain kinds of situations, but they don't seem to do the bridging and the processing. And so it's a very important part of our emotional lives. It's kind of an awful part because we're aware of our emotions all the time. And in a way, they're freed of that. And our, our neurology friends say, these are among the happiest patients in the world. So just think, if you could perforate off yourself, how, half, how much easier your life would be. Okay. So any talk like this, is, this is what I should call, uh, label the fogey alert. Um, and, I, and this is a fogey. Um, and that is that you have to say something about uh, lessons learned. Uh, it's just required. They, they tell you this before they give you the little piece of glass. You have to do this. So I don't like to give advice, but I'm going to do my best. So these are some of the lessons that I've learned uh, in being an emotion detective. I think picking good questions is really important. And these are some of the questions I said that I've picked, and I think they turned out to be all good and ones that kept me and my students and my student students and my student students students and now one more generation really interested and I think all of us continue to work on them and um, but not quite some questions aren't quite so good um, I gave a talk at the inaugural SAS meeting um, and uh, I sort of put up I made this slide and why I like this slide so much is that Jim Russell who's a dear friend, but really sees the world completely differently, sent me an email and he said, loved your, your slide. I'm going to use it in all my talks from now on. So this is a slide that Jim Russell has vetted. Um, and uh, basically the question is, are emotions switches or snowflakes? And uh, the switches people say, well, they're universal, they're fixed action patterns, and the snowflake people say they're socially constructed and contextually variable. And I think this is fundamentally the wrong question. The answer is that sometimes they're switches. Um, so for example, if you show people films that powerfully sh this, uh, show decay, disease, and contamination, and poop, lots of poop, um, 
you see this kind of response. So this was the guy that we all looked at together. I mean, he's showing it. And these are a bunch of people from, that we picked from studies. They, they vary in age. They're looking at different kinds of films. They're all looking at films. Some of them are young. Some of them are old. Some of them have neurological disease. Uh, and, and, and I ran out of space. I have hundreds more <laughs> examples, and I just couldn't shrink them all. Plus, I wanted Paul to, to code them with me before I, to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. But, you know, you see this kind of thing. You see this kind of prototypic expression under the right conditions in your lab. On the other hand, sometimes you see snowflakes. And this is a, another thing I've showed a number of times. Here are six young women. They're all the same age. They're all the same SES. They're in a, a private school in Japan. They're showing six different emotional reactions. They're all looking at exactly the same thing. So, um, so sometimes they're switches and sometimes they're snowflakes. So I think the challenge is to build some better research questions. This is a not a good research question. This is a good research question. When are they snowflakes and when are they switches? And I think that leads to testable hypotheses. And these are not ones that we've tested, but it's my thinking about them, and, and probably half of them or all of them are wrong. But I think when the stimuli closely match the prototype, typical antecedents like disease and decay for disgust, when they're powerful and they onset rapidly, and when you study the initial response before the regulation occurs, I think you see switches. But I think when the stimulus is not like that, like when it's animals copulating, which is not a particular antecedent for anything except for animals have babies, or they're weak and they're onset slowly, or even worse, if you wait and you look at the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth response, so you aren't carefully measuring over time, then there's snowflakes. I don't know if these are right, but these are disconfirmable. And it seems to me that the field of emotion research is full of these questions that are either or. We all know the answer is going to be both, right? It's like nature or nurture. We can sit there and argue about them. It might be fun. But it seems to me the real challenge is to design studies that start to get some traction on the when and the under what conditions. Because everybody's going to be right some of the time here. But what we don't do is we have very little work like this that's being done. And uh, you know, I hope I get to do some before I stop, and I hope you do. Uh, so pick good questions, polish and calibrate your magnifying glasses. Uh, Dr. Banaji's talk, uh, if you heard it, was a classic example. She found a tool, this IET test. She made it work. She's used it richly. In my work, it's our work, it's the same thing. Things like social interaction. We use them in all sorts of ways that we would have never dreamed. So spend some time on polishing your magnifying glasses, ignore naysayers, every kind of work that I've ever done, someone has said you can't do it, uh, you can't study, you can't get couples to talk in the lab, you can't get older people to come into the lab, you can't go to Sumatra and get uh, the Mononcabau to, to participate in laboratory experience. Actually, I said that, Paul said we could. Um, you know, you can't bring neurological patients into the, in the lab, they're paralyzed, they're, you know, just ignore that and just do it. You can, you can do research if you want to on almost any problem. Uh, enjoy being right. It's a rare and fleeting uh, occurrence. But really enjoy even more being wrong. Because when you're wrong, you eliminated a, a dead end for somebody who comes after you. Uh, find a way to continue to do basic research. Dr. Banaji said the same thing. It's really hard. When Paul and I were first uh, working together, we actually had grants to look at these issues without relationship to age or disease or anything. We just got a grant. We got a grant to go to Sumatra with a line item to bribe people in customs so we could get our video equipment into the country. That was a different world. If we're going to have basic research, you're going to have to find a way to divert resources and time and make sure you do some. I suggest we tithe one out of every 10 studies basic questions. So I want to thank you all. Um, these are the, the, the specific thanks for my collaborators, my graduate students, and staff, NIA, NIMH, and their program staff. Uh, Liz is here, who's been a great help. Uh, APS for this award, and all of you for attending. And um, one final bit of advice, find your own enduring mysteries and unravel them. Thank you.